Broadcast permission for the following program is made possible by the Columbia Broadcasting System. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Of all the promises a man or woman can make, I can think of no two more solemn and morally binding. The first, the answer to the question, do you take this man to love and to cherish, to honor and to obey, in sickness and health, as long as you both shall live? And the other, the Hippocratic Oath. This phrase in particular, Whatsoever house I enter, there will I go for the benefit of the sick, refraining from all wrongdoing or corruption, and especially from any act of seduction. Oh, yes, Dr. Kowalski. They told me I must be operated on immediately, but not by Dr. Kirk Malcolm. He's the only surgeon available to do it now. Dr. Hallam is a fine man, but you're risking your life by waiting for him. I feel I'd be risking my life more to go under Dr. Malcolm's knife. For crying out loud, man. This isn't the dark ages. It's still a dark age when a man's wife can be coveted and stolen, as mine has been. Any man that can break one commandment wouldn't hesitate to break another. I wouldn't let your Dr. Malcolm lay a finger on me. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Edge of the Scalpel, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Terry Keene and Gordon Gould. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The Edge of the Scalpel. This is the story of a surgeon who walked it who poised it above his deadly rival, literally holding the life of the man on the operating table in his hands. Let us follow the tall, gaunt man there who looks ten years older than his 38 years, whose aging face still retains the good looks and the mark of a spoiled and petulant youth, who walks slowly, leaning on a cane for support, to the main nurse's desk at Guardian Hospital. Excuse me. Uh, I want to see Nurse Stewart. Nurse Carrie Stewart. Oh, uh, Nurse Stewart has, uh, has duty for another three quarters of an hour. If you want to walk over to the waiting room... Uh, walking is not my strong suit, as you can see. Uh, will you ask her to come down here or put her on page? Oh, I can't page a nurse. Well, she won't mind. I'm her husband. Oh, why well, bless me. How do you do, Mr. Stewart? How do you do, Nurse McGrath? You know me. Well, why not? It's such a... Loving little family here at Guardian Hospital, isn't it? I, I think your wife is still operating with Dr. Malcolm. That's exactly what bothers me. I'll be waiting for her right by the elevator as soon as she's ready to see me. Thank you for saving another patient for me, Dr. Malcolm. Well, thank you for the correct diagnosis, Dr. Kowalski. We make a team. We all make a team. <laughs> right, Gary. Kirk, what would you do without her? <laughs> I'd hate to speculate, Ted. Or have you speculated? Oh, come on, Kirk. My reputation as the hospital Lothario is all gossip. I play the field. <laughs> now, with you and Carrie, that's uh, different. Well, here's the elevator. Care to join us? Nope. Three's a crowd. I mean... Forget it, Ted. Carrie is my surgical nurse. Sorry about that. He didn't mean anything. Well, maybe it's my guilty conscience. Coffee? A nurse and a doctor? Well, protocol is no problem to the chief of surgical services. I'll exercise a command. Coffee. <laughs> I'm yours to obey. I wish that were true. Kirk, don't, please. You never know who might... Surprise, Carrie. Your loving, if lame, husband. Joe. Uh, what brought you here? A question maybe I should be asking. Hello, Mr. Stewart. Nice to see you again. Oh, Dr. Malcolm... At the moment, I feel like the uh, 
usual third wheel. Obviously, you are happy about something special. The most fantastic operation, Joe. Kirk, uh, Dr. Malcolm just saved a man from certain death. I don't think your husband is interested in hospital small talk. Small talk? It was a miracle. A miracle? Oh, I hope I'm not interfering with it. The miracle has already taken place. I was just asking your wife to my office to have a cup of coffee. Won't you join us? I'm afraid I can't. Unless it's for some special consultation. No, no. Uh, perhaps I could be allowed to steal my wife away. You can scarcely steal what is your own, Mr. Stewart. If you'll excuse me. Certainly. Did you have to go out of your way to be rude? Was I? Oh, I didn't notice. Uh, could I sit down for a moment? Of course you can. You shouldn't be on your feet this much anyway. What brought you out here? Loneliness. Sick of looking at nothing but four walls. So I took a bus and ended up downtown feeding the pigeons. Well, it's a nice thing to do, but not to the point of exhaustion. I feel they're my kin. They walk as clumsily as I do. Only they have wings to spread and fly. Joel, why do you fight the operation that could help you? Dr. Malcolm tried to explain... I'd like to forget Kirk Malcolm. And he'd be the last person I'd be likely to tell I'm scared out of my skull of an operation. Carrie, drive me home. I can't. I'm still on duty. Well, can't you beg off? No way. We're shorthanded. Back in the same old circle. Everyone has a duty but me. You have one. Go back to work. You know there's always room in advertising for your talent. Joe, please, I should be back on the operating floor. Why did you come here? Not to spy on you, Carrie. Whatever you think. Just that my legs gave out. I, I couldn't face the bus ride home. Excuse me, Carrie, but O.R. just called down for you. Emergency. Oh, thanks, Mac. I'll be right up. Oh, I'm sorry to chuck it in your lap. Joel, here are the keys. You take the car. I'll take the bus. If only we could go back to where we started, Carrie. It was good, wasn't it? Yes, Joe, but... Look, I cannot talk now. I've got to go. A busy little breadwinner. But just hang on to one thought, lover. I'll never be satisfied with the crumbs. Yeah. It's Carrie, Joel. I won't be able to make it home for dinner. Can you manage? Oh, my greatest talent. I manage to manage, somehow. Obviously. Where are you spending the evening? With one of your doctor buddies? It's an emergency operation to try to save a young boy's leg. Oh, how noble. Will the great god, Malcolm, perform another miracle? I don't know. None of us knows. Which is exactly why you'll never get me near an operating room. They never know. None of them does. <laughs> This way, at least I have two legs. Not very serviceable, but there, in an emergency. I may be very late. Don't wait up for me. Don't try to protect my feelings. I ended being less than a whole man a long time ago. You should be very proud of what you did for that boy, Kirk. If it works. In the long run, we can all be proud, Ted. <laughs> Such modesty. Don't you love him for it, Carrie? I respect him, Dr. Kowalski. Right. I should choose my words more carefully. Well, I'm off. I have an angel waiting for me in the wings. Oh, my goodness. What is it? The time I gave Joel the car. I've got to dash if I'm to catch the last bus. No need. I'll drop you off. If you want me to. All right. There are so many things I... I'll meet you at the doctor's entrance in ten minutes. I thought inviting you to dinner might help you understand the... Well, the way things are. You mean with Joel? What can you do with a man who refuses to take advantage of what surgery might do for him? Convince him that it can. He's scared, Kirk. He needs to find somebody he can place all his trust and faith in. <laughs> I'm scarcely the man for that. Well, you almost managed to convince him last night. Is that the only reason I was invited? 
You know it wasn't. Oh, Carrie, darling. Kirk. I'll lay it right on the line, Carrie. He's afraid he wouldn't be able to hang on to you if you knew he didn't need you anymore. He has every right to hang on to me as long as he wants. Isn't that a little masochistic? I was driving the car when he first got hurt. That has nothing to do with his condition now. He has Larisha's syndrome, a deterioration of the lower aorta. I checked it out with Helen. And who's to say that wasn't an aftermath of the back injury? But that... Anyway, there are other reasons, Kirk. I made a vow when I married him in sickness and in health. I can't break that. And somehow, in this day and age, it seems... Well, I mean, I love you, Carrie. And I know you love me. Welcome. Yes, I do. But I guess, Kirk, I'm just, uh... Old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. I suppose the timing couldn't be more perfect. You're home. Thank you for delivering me right to my door. You're an important package. And the best-loved surgical nurse I've ever had. Professionally, we make a team. You were wonderful tonight. You are wonderful. Oh, how I wish... Harry. <sighs> I apologize for that. You should. It has no future. <gasps> Joel! Oh, you startled me. I just thought I'd uh, throw a little light on the subject. I gather it was a successful operation? Uh... It'll be a year before we know that for sure. Funny, I thought you'd already gotten far enough to predict results. Joe, I don't quite know what you mean, but I do know I don't feel like matching rapiers tonight. I am tired, and I want to go to bed. I'm not stopping you. Good night, Joe. Aren't you going to kiss me good night, too? So you saw. I've been waiting all evening. And watching. Well, it didn't mean anything. Or if it did... It was an end. Not a beginning. Whatever you say, Carrie. Morning, Nurse McGrath. Any problems? Oh, nothing I can't handle, Dr. Malcolm. How's the little boy? Well, so far, he's holding his own. Oh, and we have an identity for him now, I understand. Well, his name is Fenton. Tim. His parents are waiting in your office. All right. There's some reporters waiting to see you, too. Why not? You're famous. Morning, Mac. <laughs> morning, uh, Dad. Good morning, Dr. Kowalski. And indeed, you are Dr. Malcolm. Oh, you must be very proud of what you accomplished last night. Well, it balances out. Oh, Mac, has Nurse Stewart checked in yet? Uh, no. She called in earlier to say she'd be delayed. Her husband isn't feeling well. Oh? Anything serious? Oh, well, she didn't say. Any message we can give her? Why, no, it's, um... Uh... A personal matter. I'll be in my office with Tim's parents. Now, what kind of a personal matter would you suppose exists between Carrie and Kirk Malcolm? Sure, if it were common knowledge. It couldn't be very personal now, could it? <laughs> Meaning, mind my own business, huh? You said it, Doctor, not I. Well, it is sort of my business, because Dr. Malcolm is my friend. Mac, you know the hospital better than anyone. You've been here longer. But I came with the cornerstone. <laughs> Are there rumors going around about Carrie and... But I didn't plant the grapevine. And I feed it no nourishment. Uh, all I'm worried about is that any hint gets to the Iron Duke upstairs. If old Hadley up in administration noses out what's being whispered around, we could lose Dr. Malcolm and Carrie. I wouldn't want to see that. Oh, nor me. <laughs> I stayed home because I'm your wife, Joel. Not by choice. Not because you love, but out of duty. I didn't say that. You didn't have to. Maybe because it isn't true. You... What? You might be a little ashamed after last night. I told you that's a closed chapter. I doubt it. Why don't you admit you'd give anything to be rid of me? What good am I? I can't support you. I can't even make love to you. I'm a... Husband in name only. If I had any guts, I'd walk out of your life. Only I'm not very good at walking either. That's something that could be fixed. How? 
Under your surgical boyfriend's scalpel? <laughs> no, thank you. I wouldn't give him the chance to dispose of me so easily. That's a terrible thing to say. And a terrible thing that two of you are doing to me. I may be no damn good, but you're my wife. And that's what you're going to stay till... Joe? Oh. Oh, Joe, what is it? P pain. Oh, the pain. Joe. Again. Maybe you'll get your wish after all. But you hear this, Gary? You get me my own doctor, or I'll haunt you the rest of my life. An intriguing situation. A woman struggling desperately to live up to her marriage vows, committed by her conscience to a man she does not love, and a surgeon in whose hands may be placed the life of this man. There are gathering factors which could end his career as he found himself accused not only of negligence, but murder. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Now the real suspense begins. The ultimate suspense in our world. The fight to save a human life. As the door to the emergency room opens, Carrie turns toward it, her face drawn and strained. A nurse and orderly wheel Joel out, now mercifully unconscious. Doctors Kirk and Kowalski follow. Orderly, take Mr. Stewart to room 416. Dr. Kowalski will be in charge for the moment. You want him prepped for surgery? Did you get through to Dr. Hallam? Yes, he sprained a wrist two days ago playing squash. He can't handle it. <sighs> Who else do you want? I don't know anyone now else, Hold the but... prep, Ted, till we settle on a surgeon. Make sure there's an OR available and a surgical team. Can do. But, Chief, I don't think You're you You're keeping should... the patient waiting, Dr. Kowalski. Yes, sir. Let's go inside for a moment, nurse. Better sit down, Carrie. Been a rough morning for you. You don't know how rough... He'll never forgive me. I'll never forgive myself. Well, it's hardly your fault he had this attack. Isn't it? After last night? He saw us, you know. Oh. I'm sorry about that. Yes, so am I. I can't help thinking I'm responsible. Maybe we'd better stick to fact. Medical fact. Have there been any other acute attacks like this? No. Just chronic leg cramps. Nothing like this. You can guess what it might be, can't you? A thrombosis? Probably. Or an aneurysm. An arteriogram would show that. Does it matter? Either means an operation. Yes, it's indicated. However, if it is a clot, he might pass it. But the trouble with the Larice syndrome is how much it has narrowed the whole Y junction of the terminal aorta and the ileal arteries. It could cut off the blood supply to his legs? Mm -hmm. To keep him from losing them, we'd have to go in and put a shunt past the blocked area. That's what I tried to explain to him the other night. I wish you'd convinced him. So do I. Hasn't his own doctor ever recommended surgery? He's been trying to get him to let Dr. Hallam do it for the last three years. There are other effects from a Larish syndrome. Well, to put it as simply as possible, doesn't he ever want a child? I don't know. Do you? Yes, but not... Oh, it's so many things. The way I was brought up, the accident with the car... Everything Joel gave up for me. What did he give up for you? His mother wanted him to marry somebody else. She's a vindictive old woman. She cut him out of her will and refused to see him after we were married. He sounds well off without her. Well, that's just the trouble. He was very well off with her. I didn't know that when we were married... that most of his income was an allowance from her. He never dreamed she'd cut it off. But all of this doesn't matter. Joel's health comes before anything... Kirk, with Dr. Hallam out, I don't know who else to call in. He suggested Dr. Roth. No, I... no, he's too old for this. And there's nobody else here at the hospital but Dr. McNeil, and I think he's awfully young for yeah, this. He time. wouldn't want the responsibility. Nor would I allow him to take it as chief surgeon. So, will you operate? Well, let's see how it goes. If the situation is an emergency, 
and you can convince him to sign the waiver for me to operate, I'll perform it. What do you want? I'm sorry if I woke you, Mr. Stewart. Every two seconds, someone does. Uh, the worst is over. We've taken all the necessary tests. What's the verdict? I'll let Dr. Malcolm answer that. Dr. Malcolm? Oh, yes, I... I am acquainted with him, and he's acquainted with my wife. Uh, so am I. I'm Dr. Kowalski, by the way. I've heard of you. Your wife's most ardent admirer. Nice try, Doctor. Not the most ardent, though. Uh, she's quite a woman. Pretty common opinion around you doctors, I gather. One you share. Oh, I do. I also share another one that seems quite prevalent. What's that? That she's much too wonderful a woman to be wasted on a helpless invalid. Isn't that what her colleagues say? I've, uh, I've never heard anyone say it. As to your being a helpless invalid, that isn't accurate. In a sense, what happened to you this morning may turn out to be your lucky break. In what sense? Well, you could have gone along for years with a chronic circulatory condition. Now that it's acute, something has to be done about it. An operation? Well, that... Well, that's up to Dr. Malcolm. Oh, no, my friend. It is not. Only over my dead body. How's the patient, Dr. Kowalski? Just uh, fair, Dr. Malcolm. Forgive me, Carrie. That's all right. I want to know. Okay. This is right to the roots. There's advanced claudication in the lower extremities. I'd say immediate operative procedure is indicated. Does my husband agree? I didn't tell him directly. I said that was up to the surgeon. Well, then let's settle it right now. Why don't you have a talk with him first, Carrie? All right. But you do feel it's an emergency, Dr. Kowalski. I know damn well it is. Then I'll prepare him. Thanks. Who is going to operate, sir? I am. If Mr. Stewart agrees, Mrs. Stewart has asked me to. Oh. Well, he's in pretty poor general health. He might not come through. I know. But if he isn't operated on, he could lose one or both of his legs. Or his life. Look, why stick your neck out? A surgeon sticks his neck out every time he takes that knife in hand. I'm the only surgeon in this hospital or presently available that's best suited for the job. Anything else you want to say, Dr. Kowalski? No, sir. Except, good luck. What will they do, Carrie? Stop the pain, or, or can they really put me all the way back to what I was before? There's every chance they can. You sound pleased at the prospect. Why wouldn't I be? Joel, I want to see you healthy and... and complete... So you can walk out on me at last? You should know me better than that. Okay. Okay, okay, you win. But first, if I agree to an operation, do you promise never to leave me? I promise. Huh. Then let's get Dr. Hallam and get this over with. Hallam? Well, isn't he the surgeon? He sprained his wrist. He's not available. Well, then who else? The finest surgeon you could want right here in this hospital. Malcolm? Yes. <laughs> you think I'd let him touch me? The man who wants you every bit as much in the world as I want you? Joel, where a surgeon is concerned, there are no emotions involved. But where love is concerned, there is nothing else. I can only judge this by myself. And I tell you, if I were in his spot and, and had the chance... The pain. I, I, I can't. Help me, Carrie. Oh, I am in such terrible pain. Help me. Dr. Malcolm, you sure we should go through with this? You're the internist. You know that it's crucial. And the time is the main criterion. Well, suppose you lose him. Why should I? The actuarial figures are 5% mortality under normal conditions. But with complications. I'm a surgeon, not a mathematician. You'll need a little briefing on this one, Dr. Kowalski. 
and the rest of us were scrubbing up. It's an unusual operation, so we will put it on closed-circuit TV. I don't think I have to go into any details here. We'll wait for the operating theater. Blood pressure? 200 over 120. I don't like that. Still, there was bound to be hypertension. How long are we going to be, Dr. Malcolm? Not less than three hours is my guess. Could be twice that. Ask Dr. Frost on anesthesia if he can hold him. Nurse, let me see your instrument tray. You can switch on the closed-circuit TV now. For most of you observing this operation, this will be your first experience with a LaRiche syndrome. The patient involved is at a critical stage, since a large thrombus, or blood clot, is cutting off the main circulation to the interior organs and the lower extremities. So, operative procedure is mandatory. Is everyone ready, Dr. Kowalski? Ready, Dr. Malcolm. Very well. Nurse, skin knife. Nurse, I am Mrs. Choate Stewart. My son is being up. You? Hello, Mother Stewart. Yes, me at the same old stand. Never mind you. What about Joel? Is he all right? He's on the operating table right now. How could you allow it? It wasn't a matter of allowing it. He has a thrombosis. It's his life. He had a life before he met you. Who is the surgeon, may I ask? Dr. Hallam? Dr. Hallam had an injury. He wasn't able to operate. Well, didn't he suggest a replacement? Yes, but... But what? Mother Stewart, please... Look, come with me to the nurse's lounge just down the hall. I'd like you to see just what it is that's involved. I am less interested in that than in who is handling things. I thought you didn't care about us anymore. Substantially correct, I don't care about you. But when my only son is at death's door, I feel I had to return to make sure he was getting the best of care. How did you know about Joel? He called me to say he was in excruciating pain and was being taken to the hospital. He was afraid for his life. What does that mean? Exactly what it says. Who is operating? And now that the superimposed thrombus has been removed, we can see the poor condition That's of the That's Dr. Aorta. Malcolm on the TV. The best surgeon available to save Charles. But the one person my son called me and begged me to save him from... The patient has been unable to Why, walk... He'll... He'll kill him. Oh, that's ridiculous. Other effects Kirk... will have been... I mean, Dr. Malcolm will do everything to save his life. Organs, including possible Did Joel possible sign an agreement to have Dr. Malcolm operate? Uh, to return the patient no, to normal but life... No, Who did? Not be enough to close the I did. You? He's in the best of hands. Well, we'll see about that. Doctor, Mother Stewart, I wish you would... Quiet, quiet, quiet. quiet. An aneurysm. Oh, something's the happening on the television. Ready to pop. We'll ligate above it. Stand by with suction. We've run into a complication. A break in the intima, or the inner wall of the artery, is letting blood under pressure into the media. If this should rupture the outside wall, the patient could be lost. What do you plan to do, Doctor? I've heard and seen all I need. Well, that's some now reason. I'll tell you what Joel what told me. Well, that he was afraid that somehow you and Dr. Malcolm were going to maneuver him under Dr. Malcolm's knife. He couldn't be in better hands. That is a matter of opinion. I'm going to try to put him back on his feet. I just want to warn you, Kelly, that if anything happens to my boy, I'll have no interest in a civil case. It will be criminal all the way. And I will name Dr. Malcolm, who has broken up your marriage for premeditated murder. And you, as accessory, both before and after. After the fact. In the operating theater, the drama of life and death is played out according to established rules. Or is it? And watching the drama, two women are as completely involved as if the instruments were in their hands. I'll return shortly with Act Three. point of drama. Suspense piled upon suspense. Conflict on conflict. 
Watching on closed-circuit TV are the wife of the patient, whose life rests in the hands of the surgeon, and with her, the patient's mother, to whose biased, bitter, horrified mind her son appears to be helpless. I want it stopped. You can't do that. This is Joel's chance to become a whole man again. Or a dead one. I want it stopped. There is no way we can now. Shh, now be quiet and listen. After consultation, we have decided to continue with the operation. The object now is to bypass the degenerated arteries by means of artificial ones. I am aware that there is some risk to the patient... <gasps> He admits it. But as surgeon, I assume that risk as justified in the overall picture. If you kill him, I'll make you pay. Scalpel. I am now making the incisions in the wall of the aorta to receive the plastic ducts that will bypass the degenerative condition observed earlier. A condition which, of course, we cannot repair. I'll make you both pay. You mark my words. <laughs> Anesthesiologist reports he's throwing premature beats, Dr. Malcolm. I'm almost finished. He's on the edge of cardiac arrest. Then let's hope he doesn't go over it. I need five more minutes. Then we can close. It's going to be a long five minutes, sir. If I can buy those for him, I can buy him a long, healthy life. It's got to be worth it. How much longer do I have to wait here till someone tells me whether my son is alive or not? Mother Stewart, you know he's alive. You saw on the monitor and heard the end of the operation. He looked more dead than alive after all that. Joel came through it. He lived. And he's going to be everything he ever was before. Then why isn't someone down here to tell us so? Because it takes a few minutes for the surgeons to clean up. The first moment he can, I'm sure Kirk... I'm sure Dr. Malcolm will be down to give his report. Kirk! Hmm? Nurses call doctors by their first names. So Joel was correct. Yes, I'm sure he'll be down to report to you, not to me. He doesn't even know I'm here. He should be here any moment. Oh, I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to even be near him. Not the man who planned to break up my son's marriage. I took... You were the one who was against Joel marrying me. I should think you'd have been glad to have any excuse for something to break it up. Oh... Is that what you have in mind? You think I'd permit a little snip like you to walk out on my son? I have no intention of walking out. As long as Joel wants me, I'm his. If I know Joel, he'd never allow you to make a fool of him. It must have made you pretty desperate to attempt anything like this. Sorry I took so long. I'd have phoned, but I thought you'd rather hear the news in person. I'd like to hear it too. I happen to be his mother. This is Dr. Kowalski. Since who... I have been sitting here for hours watching him on that TV screen, I'm quite aware of that. And of other things. You were against the latter half of this operation, Dr. Kowalski, or whatever the name is, correct? Against? Mother Stewart, Dr. Kowalski was only expressing an opinion as an internist when he was asked. I don't recall his being asked. Am I to understand my son is still alive? Of course. He came through very well. There's every hope for him. Every hope for what? I don't quite understand. His life? Naturally. And beyond that? It's... Well, it's not up to me to make predictions, especially till he comes out from under the anesthetic. And who's in charge of that? Dr. Malcolm. He's in the recovery room with a battery of nurses and doctors. I want to see Joel... Oh, well, that wouldn't do any good for several hours yet. Either to you or to him. Very well. I shall wait here. I want to be the first to see him. By hospital procedure, it would be his wife. His wife and I can straighten that out between us. I just want to be sure I am notified at the first moment. <laughs> A whirling witch, Mac. I kid you not. Just because I'm an elder citizen around here, Doctor. Stop trying to get me mixed up in what doesn't concern me. Mac, we both love Kirk like he was your son and my big brother. Do you... It was a hell of a risk he took. Was it for the patient? For Kerry? Or for himself? Well, what do you mean, himself? 
If Joel Stewart had no physical problems and doesn't need nursing care, wouldn't that leave Carrie free to make a choice which she's never been able to make? Since there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Find your own business. Welcome back, Mr. Stewart. I got through it, Doctor. You have a remarkable will to live. I told my wife I wanted to die. Your conscious wish, perhaps. Your unconscious was much stronger. And uh, what was your wish, Doctor? To keep you alive. It's my practice, when I can. Even when you're in love with a patient's wife? I won't answer that. Would you like to seek your wife? I suppose so. I'll bring her in. Oh, uh, Dr. Malcolm? Yes? I suppose I should thank you. It's not necessary. I really shouldn't. You'd have done all three of us a favor if you'd made sure I didn't survive. Well, Carrie, it looks as though... Uh, excuse me, Dr. Malcolm, I don't believe you've met Joel's mother, Mrs. Choate Stewart. A uh, pleasure, ma'am. That remains to be seen. Is my son still alive? Well, of course. I came to tell his wife she could see him briefly. Both of you, if you desire. You can see him first if you want, Mother Stewart. I think I do. One question, Doctor. Do you expect him to live? I haven't a doubt, barring unforeseen complications. And will he be his old self? If you mean physically... I confidently expect, with therapy and proper care, in three months he'll be as active and healthy as all of us. I want to see him. All right. Nurse, take Mrs. Stewart to the recovery room. Shall we go along? Uh, no. Give Mother Stewart a little time with him alone first. Very well. Shall I accompany you? I would prefer to see him alone. As you wish. If you'll just go with the nurse... Quite an old battle axe. Well, that's about the politest name I can think of for. Oh, Kirk, you took some awful risks. I did what I felt had to be done. Not just for me. Of course not. I mean, it wasn't in your mind or your heart that if Joel was no longer an invalid, then perhaps you would Not I... while I was operating, no. But now it is. No, it's too late. Whatever else might have been possible before, I promised Joel if he had this operation, I would never leave him. So, please, Kirk, let's leave it at that. If you love me. I can't... I just can't take any more. If I love you. Well, let's put it this way, Carrie. Because I love you, I leave it. It's a matter of conscience. <laughs> Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all. That isn't fair, Kirk. I won't... I can't renege on a promise. I guess I... I wouldn't ask you to. So, this is the... Uh, the end for us? There never was a beginning. Now I must go to my husband... Please don't pretend, Carrie. I'm not pretending. <laughs> you can hardly wait to start nursing me again, hmm? Does that mean I still have a wife? Yes. For better or worse, in sickness and in health, or always? Would you promise? I promise. <laughs> you had your chance, Carrie, you and your surgeon... You should have lost me. What did you save me for? I'm a hard and unpredictable old woman, Carrie. And I've learned a lot of things today. A respect for others that I give seldom and grudgingly. A recognition of my own selfishness and of your unselfishness. The dedication of your surgeon, Dr. Malcolm. The weaknesses in my own child. Some of which he inherited from me. Mother Stewart, let, I... let me finish. It will be a long and expensive convalescence. I can afford it. 
You can't. He will mend physically, but all the flaws in his character, which I see so clearly for the first time, will still be there. When I told him I would remake my will in his favor and renew his allowance, he jumped at the chance. Mother, I can manage. I am perfectly willing... I know you are, Carrie. And now that it's too late, I wish you were to be my daughter-in-law. I don't understand. Everything I offered Joel was contingent on one thing. That he gave you your freedom. It didn't take him a second to make up his mind. But he needs me. No, he needs a crutch. I can provide him all the various sizes and shapes he needs. You and your Kirk put my Joel back on his feet. Now let me do the same for you. There's one thing your surgeon, no matter how sharp his scalpel, could never do. Cut the umbilical cord. I've set you free from Joel. How can you answer for him? It's all been discussed. I can answer. And what about me? It's my unwedding gift to you. Whatever your heart most desires. It was a quiet wedding six months later for Dr. Kirk Malcolm and the former Mrs. Joel Stewart. Ted Kowalski was best man and everyone else who had attended the operation was there except for the patient himself. He was traveling in Europe with his mother a Gordian knot had been untied by the ancient method of cutting through it. But whose scalpel was sharper? The surgeon or that vitriolic old lady who had strength enough to admit her mistakes? I'll be back shortly. One last quote from the Hippocratic aphorisms, which seems fitting to close this case history. Life is short and art is long. The crisis is fleeting. Experiment risky. Decision difficult. Not only must the physician be ready to do his duty, but the patient, the attendants, and external circumstances must contribute to the cure. Our cast included Terry Keene, Gordon Gould, Don Scardino, Robert Caliban, and Joan Shea. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You don't belong here. You belong in some kind of an asylum. You don't mind, Luigi. I'm taking my drink over to one of the tables. And if I were you, Luigi, I'd call an ambulance. Now, just Put a this minute. Thing. Take your crummy hands off you me. You ignorant little huckster. Luigi, he's getting a little violent. You'd better throw him out before he loses control. Come. What do you think you're doing? Put that broken... Don't you take down. another step toward me, Delaney. Not one step. You really are crazy. Just stay where you are. What do you think you're threatening? Oh! Oh, my God! Oh! Push that broken bottle into my face! Hey! Hey, you pushed Delaney over. He hit his head. He's out cold, and his face and head are all covered with blood. I didn't mean to. Maybe you better send for a doctor. Mr. Quaylen, you can't leave now. Don't try to follow me, any of you. Where are you going? Well, none of you will ever find me. Not if you were to live forever. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams...
preceding program was broadcast with the permission of the Columbia Broadcasting System.